Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for February 22nd, 2022. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, a certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is the webcast and podcast that digs deep into the clutter that piles up between you and the life you want to be living. We explore the habits and behaviors that lead to clutter, and we suggest strategies to slow the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we decide to keep. If you're new to the Zoom meeting, we want to let you know that you can share your comments and questions via the chat feature, and I'll try to make sure Gail gets to them before we move on to another topic. You can also use a raise hand feature to let us know that you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. And we are also streaming the webcast live on Facebook. So you can share your questions and comments there and I'll relay them to Gail. We're going to start as we usually do by talking about last week's weekly title, which was called Deconstructing the Sandwich. We talked about the sandwich generation. The assignment was to begin or advance the process for managing your own family's generational clutter. We'd love to hear from our participants in Zoom and on Facebook. Who moved a generational clutter project or conversation forward this week? Please share with us in the comments. We got several really nice comments from people who've started that conversation or process, either to deal with their parents' clutter before they inherit it or to deal with their own clutter before they pass it on to children. One of my favorites came from YouTube viewer CM who wrote, as an elder adult, my strongest motivation to declutter is the love I have for my adult children. I respect their own new families and careers too much to waste their precious time sorting through my possessions and paperwork. That's my responsibility, not theirs. Too many of my elder peers walk away from their own mess of stuff and knowingly dump their work on their busy adult children. And that is very considerate of you, truly. It's a lot of work to clear someone else's stuff and anything that you can do to lessen the bomb that drops on them when the time comes can only be a gift to them. My mom did that for us. She had been going through and organizing things for several years before she passed. And it made the clear out easier because we didn't have to sort through a bunch of scrambled areas. Mostly she had arranged like with like, and we had gone through many areas together to whittle it down to what she loved to have. And even so it was a house full of things that made her happy. And it was a big job to clear it out, but her organizing work to both sort things and thin things out made a huge difference in the volume of the job that we had to do. Best for us was the work I did with her on the garage. <laughs> the garage was a black hole when she and I started there and it was a very manageable project when we had to clear her house later. So thanks to Christine for the comment. Connie said, have to wait until daughter moves to new home, but then... <laughs> da, da, da. yeah she's got to get through her own move job first she can't do both that's a lot to ask somebody to deal with those two things simultaneously so nice of you to wait <laughs> yeah Catherine said sent my goddaughter to help deal with her parents cj said i created some documents summarizing your advice from the last few weeks and sent them to my mom to help her sort we got a, a couple like Ooh. that. A couple of people said they shared last week's episode with parents or, or children. We, I mm -hmm. think we had comments going both ways, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly, a lot of people are in this situation because it, uh, it resonated across a lot of our audience, I think. Well, the numbers that I read on the demographics of clutter in gen generations were really interesting. I read a lot of stuff we didn't go into, like the hoarding disorder diagnosis is much more common in older people. It get, gets more common as people age mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because there is some connection between, in some cases, there's a connection between cognitive decline and the tendency to hoard. Mm. Yeah, but, as, um, as executive functioning starts to break down a little. Yeah. Connie said she also shared ideas with her English conversation group, which is nice. Oh. Secra or Secre had to bring home bins of my childhood stuff and going through it now. Very hard to discard. Trying to keep my favorites. I like history and preserving. And you can't take it all with you. <laughs> and, and you can't surrender all of your house space to keeping it. 
And by the time you are middle-aged or uh, old-aged, that collection is probably super huge. And so uh, anything that you can do to thin it out so it doesn't take up a huge amount of space is helpful. And there's always going to be things that are um, more favorite than and less favorite. And so keep the ones that are more favorite, keep the ones that are more emotionally rich for you and, um, you know, bless and kiss some other things and send them on. Rowan shared, I got up the nerve recently to explain to my 96 year old mother that my life is not about having things, furniture, decor, et cetera, and that things are not the way I remember. So if anyone else wants things, that is fine with me. I had a similar conversation with my parents and said, you know, I like that thing and I like that thing. And really, if anybody else has a prior claim on anything else, they should have it because I, you know. You, you didn't want to add to the collection. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, there was that pivot point where your parents moved out of the house that they had been living in for what, probably 10 or 15 years, I guess. Yeah, I think it was about At 15. that point. Yeah. And so everything that they had brought with them into that house and they had aged the last 15 years in that house, then they were moving into independent living. They were doing the whole downsizing thing and they had to massively get rid of stuff. And yeah. I know that Anne went and worked with them and uh, all of the siblings sort of showed up and did a turn and some of their, some of the decluttering and, well they had they had done a lot of you know every time any of us visited they asked they were sending things you know, away right what, what else can you what what can you take home if, if anybody was driving they yes. asked you know what can you take home or what can we ship to you right. or what do you want to just what do you want to lay claim to so that we know that you want it when the time comes and and the all really what happens is you do that process of claiming the things that you love and it's it claims the cream of the crop it pulls 10 percent out of the house and it leaves you with the other 90 percent to deal with and so i'm sure they had to give up and donate a huge amount of stuff in order to fit into that apartment because i know all of you even though there's six siblings you guys didn't take more than 15 percent of the contents out of there right and so yeah. they still had a big project to manage and yeah uh, luckily they had you know they had help and you and beth are there and everybody came and worked and and made trips up to help well, and, and my brother-in-law and... bob did uh yeoman's work right he, did he came and did a lot of work, of work. Yeah. exactly yeah. and so there was a whole team of people to help them which was a good thing <laughs> but it, but it, it's it's a big project and it's not something um i've had people over the years make comments about my kids never did anything for me so why should i do something for them and and they clearly have some resentment and anger with their relationship with their kids and so they feel like leaving them all the junk is kind of a punishment. And, and I agree it is, <laughs> it is, it's a good punishment to leave all their stuff, all your stuff to them to clean up. But um, it's also guaranteed to make the, the last thoughts that they have to, of you to be as angry and, and upset as possible. And so um, maybe you'd rather them think something else when they're clearing out your house. Just a thought. <laughs> Claire who is with us on Facebook shared swamped my adult children with many, many photos of my valuable antiques, ha junk and clutter. I am now clear that they want about two out of every 20 items, which was at first a bit galling, but I'm ready now to get rid of the rid of the rest of the stuff that obviously no one wants, including myself. Yeah. She and LOL'd at the end of that, but that's a serious point. And it's one of the good reasons to, start having that conversation because you may be operating under the assumption that your kids feel the same way about your stuff that you do and you are probably not correct correct <laughs> i mean and but if you think about it, it without the attachment of this is my stuff and they should want my stuff if you take that out of the equation just think about the idea of you are a unique human and all of your children and relatives are also unique humans and everybody has their own interests, their favorite colors, their favorite styles, their favorite stuff. And it's not, you guys are not the same people there. There's, you're not carbon copies of each other. So why would you expect that they would want all the same things that you do? It's not realistic. 
you are unique and you like a unique set of items and it is not going to wholesale translate to the next person because they are not a carbon copy of you. And so on the one hand, it feels galling that they're rejecting your stuff. But if you think about it for a minute outside of your relationship with that person, you can realize we're totally different people. We are interested in totally different pursuits. We have different favorite colors and styles and everything. And the idea that they would want everything that I own just isn't, isn't logical on the face of it there. <laughs> it, aside from all the emotion that feels like you're being rejected by your children, you're really not. They're just being different people and wanting a different collection of things than your collection. And, and yes, there is some in, intersection. The 10 or 15% that they want that Ed took home was the stuff that he liked and thought would work in his house or that he would actually use in his life. But the rest of it was something that his parents were into and, and other siblings had to pick from. And the intersection, there, there will be a sliver of intersection, but it won't be 100%. Yeah is my point. I'll share one more comment and then we'll move on to our main topic. And this is from Barbara who said, when you leave everything, then the things precious to you will get dumped with the junk. Mm -hmm. So that's a, because they have a hard way of telling. That's a really persuasive argument in favor of having a conversation while you can and communicate why the thing is important to you, what you love about it. And then if they absorb that and feel the same way, they'll cherish it too and if they don't you're not going to talk them into wanting something they don't want yeah exactly and i think one of the things that happens is <clears throat> when it's a when it's all mixed in, in a big pile they can't tell what is special and what is junk and so either it all gets thrown out as junk or the the opposite of that sometimes happen they assume everything was super important and they keep it all when clearly it's not all important, but they don't, in their own grief and, and sense of loss, they can't evaluate, oh, this, this list of the groceries was probably not important. This stuff stuffed in the back of this cabinet was probably things that mother forgot was there and she doesn't even, it didn't matter to her. So they value all of it equally and take it all home because they feel like they're disrespecting you if they don't. And then they end up hauling a bunch of stuff that you clearly would have thought of as junk if you'd gotten around to it. And then they get burdened with things that you in no way would have kept otherwise. And so um, it, it, it can be a double-edged sword either, either way if you don't communicate what is the stuff that's truly special to you versus the stuff you're just living with because you haven't gotten around to getting it out of there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's get on to the main topic. We have, there's some other good comments we might want to circle back to, but okay. um, it's a lively conversation today. Our main topic today is about multi-purpose spaces. Do you have an office that doubles as a guest room, a Zoom studio, a library, a craft room, and a gift wrapping room? How about a closet that doubles as a pantry, or maybe a spare bedroom that doubles as an overflow closet? I, we, I live some of these things. Um, today, we're going to examine the organizing issues of multifunction spaces, and Gail will offer some strategies for optimizing your use of these challenging but versatile rooms. The inspiration for our topic today comes from Lorraine. She said this in a, in a chat in a previous episode. When we built the house, I already started with my own craft room. Throughout the years, it has become the dumping zone. And now it looks like a hoarder's room, which, by the way, has become my new office since COVID. <laughs> we don't all live in mansions with 25 rooms available for all of our needs, and some rooms have to serve double duty or triple duty even, especially since COVID has made so many of us start doing our daytime work from home. This is more true than ever. Besides that, you need a space that can appear in a Zoom background without your dying of embarrassment. We're making some unusual demands on our homes these days. Think about all the rooms that get called into service for multiple functions. The obvious ones are the spare bedroom and the dining room, but other areas have been claimed for multifunction as well, like the kitchen desk or the cubby hole that is in a built-in kitchen, your finished basement that can be a storage room and a whole lot of other things. 
The garage is a good space, although there's uh, temperature management issues with it most of the time. The and, laundry room. And moisture. And moisture, exactly. Yeah. In Houston, it's swampy. Yeah. Uh, a laundry room, a mud room, a utility room is also one that gets used for several things. But really, any area carved out of just about any room <laughs> is a space that you're trying to manage and make useful. And what are all these spaces used for? So the primary one, that if anybody was to be quizzed about it, the primary answer would be a guest room. But you're also using it for your home office, which is much more busy and active than it was before COVID, I'm sure. Uh, you might be creating a library or a reading room. Lorraine, of course, has an art and craft hobby room, like so many of us, uh, a media room or a home theater. Where do you guys sit around and watch movies? Um, your Zoom studio, like where do you make sure that the background is bland and appropriate for you know your public face on Zoom? Reasonably clean and contains the requisite copy of the power broker on the shelf behind you. <laughs> There you go. That's Ed's corner. <laughs> um, also, the, there's always, always a storage space or overflow closet somewhere. A music room. Um, if you are somebody who is practicing or performing, then you probably have to have an area where you practice the guitar or practice the flute or whatever that is part of a room. Um, an exercise space. Um, are you trying to exercise or do yoga or do some dance work at home as part of your exercise? Then that's got to be wedged in somewhere. A meditation space, the kids playroom or nursery, the DIY workshop. Um, generally, uh, that would be because it involves tools. <laughs> it's probably outside or in the garage or in a shed, but still uh, the gift wrapping room. And very often, surprisingly often, there's an overflow pantry somewhere. Uh, I have lots of clients who the kitchen pantry isn't big enough, and then they go put a rack in a closet, or they go into the basement and rack a bunch of stuff there. They go in the garage and put up stuff, or there's a shelf in a hallway somewhere, or they take over part of the dining room in order to keep extra pantry stuff. And I always think, really? We don't want to just like use the volume that you have and you really want to have the extra container over there with stuff hanging on it, but okay. Um, and Ed's favorite one is a bar. <laughs> Everybody has a deep, has an extra space for a bar or maybe it's just Ed. <laughs> Well, <laughs> we have finally moved to a place that's so small, there is no room for a bar. So the bar is the freezer where we keep the, a few bottles of things. And then up on top of a, 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 a cabinet, there are a few more bottles of things. And all the rest of the bar is stored in uh, cabinets with, you know, everyday stuff. Your glass is in there. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I know it gets used. I've been offered cocktails at your house, so I know it's getting <laughs> used. <laughs> so clearly, I, you know, I made a list of all of the things that you are trying to accomplish, and you probably have 25 areas that you want to have in your space, and you only have seven rooms. And so clearly, they're going to double or triple up in order to accomplish it. And so that means you got to create more than one function in a room. And there's some strategies to do around that. Um, the first one being identify all the uses and who the users are going to be for that particular space. So let's pick the room that Lorraine gave us that what was her craft room that became her junk room that came her office. So she really has um, probably two defined purposes there. She wants it to be an office in a craft space and probably doesn't want it to be the junk room. So we, we can identify that it's currently being used as a junk room, but that needs to be deconstructed. And then it needs to be set up to be craft room in one area, an office in another area. So you want to identify what those functions are going to be in that particular room and then who is going to come in there and use it. And then plan how you'll use the space so it doesn't default to being the catch-all. You can define separate zones in that room 
And that's part of planning out the space. So where is function A going to be in this, in Lorraine's craft room, she's going to have a craft section and which, you know, every craft room always looks sort of like it's in the middle of chaos. <laughs> if you've been in there actively crafting, then it always looks uh, disturbed. And so you clearly don't want that in your office background while you're working. So you want those zooms, to, those uh, zones to be very clearly defined and separated from each other. So I would imagine that she could have two desks or two tables that are back to back and on sitting facing the office table, um, she can be doing crafting and have all her craft supplies, craft supplies behind her. And then sitting on the office side, facing the craft side, she can have all her office stuff and all of her office supplies and maybe her, you know, clean zoom background behind her so that whatever's happening on the craft side in no way appears on the office side or in the zoom, right? And so uh, drawing that big line down the middle and saying this part is about office and this part is about craft is a way that you can create two zones in the same room. Um, think of them as cubicles. Think about how a cubicle separates a space. You take a big open space and you sort of create a false wall when you put a cubicle up that separates one cubicle from the next cubicle. But you can do the same thing in your own room uh, using furniture, screens, boxes, storage units, um, bookshelves, things like that to help you visualize where the zone starts and ends in that particular space. If you only have two functions in a room, then creating the zones is going to be pretty easy. You're going to divide it in some portion of two, whether one's a smaller and one's a bigger portion of that, it's a little bit easier. But when you get into, I've got to do three things in here, or I've got to do four things in here, then clearly defining those breakouts between zones with some furniture or movable storage things, rolling carts on wheels, things like that, to help you define where the, the area begins and ends will make it easier for you to keep up with what the functions are. <laughs> it, the more functions in a room, the more you have to be strategic about where you put things. You can't, don't put zone A stuff down in zone C and vice versa. You want to keep it clean so that you can keep up with the zones. And so the more you have to wedge in there, the harder it gets. A lot of people struggled with adding in their dining room or their kids room or where, they had to like create a space for two adults to work from home. And then they had to create a space for three kids to go to school from home. And that must've been a nightmare. There must've been computers deployed all over the house and everybody had to have good zoom backgrounds behind them or else, you know, you were sharing with whoever what was going on. Although no one I'm sure was surprised <laughs> given everyone was in the same boat at the same time. That many people trying to all be on the computer simultaneously has been a really big struggle for lots of people to cope with. And they did things like there was a home office and one adult used it and then another adult moved in and they sat on either side of each other and both had to, had to use that space and the kids had to be set up in the hallway or in their bedroom or in the dining room or somewhere else so that they could not be listening to the adults talk and vice versa, they wouldn't be interrupting each other. It must have been a real struggle to make it happen. Hopefully, uh, most of you aren't quite in that position anymore. Most of the kids have gone back to some amount of school, even though they might be still doing a little bit of stay at home when the weather's bad or when they think there's a big outbreak. And the pressure might be off a little bit after the last year and a half of having all everybody working from home during the day. Support those multiple functions with the furniture that you choose. And you can add in here furniture that serves more than one purpose, like a chair that has storage, a bench that has storage, a storage that has wheels so it can move around and be in more than one place. Um, uh, things that hang on the wall that function as storage as well. Bookcases that have cubbies in them that can hold things besides books that kind of stuff. You can add in furniture that has multiple functions and put things under the bed in under the bed units, make those zones function with as much double duty serving furniture and as, as much 
movable or identifiable storage as you can have. Um, if one of the functions is a guest room, I just want to say this about having a guest room. You really want to think about what's needed for a guest to feel comfortable and ask yourself, would you like to sleep here? Can they hang up their clothes? Where can they open their luggage? Where can they charge their phone or put a glass of water next to the bed? And you want to balance those needs with the fact that the other 360 days a year, you'll be using the room for the other four purposes that you have in that room. So you might be able to create some movable storage that can be in place most of the time when you're in there, the 360 days you're doing something in there. And then it can be rolled out or rolled into the closet or moved around out of the way when your guests arrive. So that once they're in the room, you're temporarily not going to be doing anything in there. And so you can sort of shove stuff over into your side and give them more room and more functionality. And then when they're gone again, then you can move the stuff back out for you. Whatever you need to do to facilitate that would be helpful to you both. You don't want it to be a big pain in the patootie to have to clear the space for the guests. Like you don't want it to be a huge moving and deconstruction project when somebody says they're going to come and stay at your house. Keep in mind your ease of, of deconstructing the room and setting it up for guests and make that part be easy for you as well as them. And then it, you can, if it's easy to take down, then it'll be easy for you to put back as well. <clears throat> and I would also say reconsider those traditional spaces that don't fit your lifestyle right now. Lots of people have formal dining rooms and no one actually goes in there. <laughs> so they never use it or they use it once a year for, or they have Thanksgiving dinner and Easter there or something like that. If you have a room that is there and present and served a purpose for a long time, but doesn't really, those purposes only account for a week out of the year and the rest of the time, nobody really goes in there then I would consider that room ripe for serving a dual purpose, for having another uh, use besides what it was originally designed for. And that's why dining rooms have become desks <laughs> for people in COVID because here's a big flat table that has chairs ready at it already with lighting and you can sit down and set up and start working immediately. And it can be a desk for the 363 days. And then you can take your desk down and move it out of the way when you're actually gonna have people come and sit around the table. Rethinking those traditional spaces, a formal living room, a formal dining room, a nursery, a, the, the second office, you can, just because it was called an office when you bought the house, doesn't mean it has to stay an office. It can be anything that you want. And so reimagining those rooms allows you to add the functions in that you want. So it's important to identify what functions you want to be able to do in the house. And then just look at your whole floor plan and say, which of these rooms can have combined purposes? Can I think about using it in a non-traditional way and really support my family instead of maintaining this big formal dining room with all this stuff in it? And then I don't actually use it very often. It would be better to support your family and having that room accessible for another purpose for all year, all year round. Think about it that way. You're helping your family with the, with the square footage that you've got to do the things that is important to them and creating those zones that are portable and movable so that you can set up your desk and your supplies are there with you, but they're on wheels and you can roll it out of the room when it's time for Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas parties or whatever. If it's portable and shiftable, then you can make it disappear down the hall while you're having that dining experience. And then it can all come back and set up easily for you when you're ready to start working again. Um, I have a little list of, of uh, sort of solution products here I want to throw out as well. Um, one of them is a sofa bed. Obviously, if you're going to have guests, having a sofa bed means that you can pull out the bed when somebody's there and you can fold it up and it takes less of a footprint when it's folded up as a sofa. And if it's in a room where you're working, then you can sit on the sofa and use the sofa while there's not guests. Um, a traditional Murphy bed is a great idea. Stands up against the wall. They make them with, you know, what ends up being the feet of the desk when it, when it pulls up, it's shelving units. And so you can get a Murphy bed that swings down and 
the shelves become the floor, <laughs> the floor feet of the bed and then pulls back up and you can have shelves again. Um, there's really fancy versions and there's uh, less fancy versions, but at least a Murphy bed provides a bed and then makes it disappear all the other times when you're not, when you don't have guests. Um, art and craft storage carts. There's lots of things that are made with plastic drawers and wheels to snap on the bottom. Um, any of those would make it easy for you to transition over where the guests would normally stay and then roll it away from where the guest is going to stay to give them room and roll it back. Roll it into the dining room to use it to work and then roll it out to a closet when it's time for dining. Anything that is on wheels that moves stuff around so it allows you to not have to haul and cart and stack somewhere. You can just pick it up and roll it down the hall. <clears throat> That's going to be supporting you in having multiple use rooms. Under the bed storage, any place that you have a guest bed, uh, clearly you want to be able to put things under the storage. And it doesn't have to be things that the guests need, but it can be the sheets to go with it. If you have a sofa bed or a, a, any kind of a day bed, you can put things underneath it that dress the bed. Here's the bedding for this bed, but I don't want it out the rest of the time. Maybe you have a day bed that you can sit on like a couch and it has drawers below so that they can sleep on the day bed and they can pull the drawers out and put things into the drawers while they're, they're visiting you. Or you can use those drawers for storage and they can sleep on the bed. And so that's one of those dual purpose beds dual purpose pieces of furniture that the bed, the day bed allows you to sit. It allows them to sleep and then might have some storage underneath it. Room dividers are super helpful. Um, you can create a, you know, use a screen, any kind of a stand up screen function that allows you to separate the rooms visually. And it might mean that you don't have to clean up as much <laughs> when the guest comes, but it also means that you can have a screen between, you know, here's your office and your zoom background. And maybe the screen is the Zoom background. And then there can be another function of the room behind you. And you don't have to worry about it if you have a screen there. Um, office furniture that doubles as a nightstand. <laughs> there you go. If you have a, um, a, a, a file drawer, a file unit. Like a two drawer filing cabinet. Yeah, yeah. yeah a little filing well. cabinet can be, it's low enough that it can be next to your desk part, but it can also be between you and the bed. And so then you can clear that off long enough for them to be able to use it as a nightstand while they're there. And that would be an easy thing. Um, <laughs> this is a good word, cloth This is a compact office in a closet. Um, I actually, a lot of people resorted to using their closets as their quiet room, you know, the sound, <laughs> sound contained room when they were on Zoom. And so they're walk-in closets. Yeah, if you had a, a walk-in closet with some room, it, it suddenly became an alternative office. <laughs> and that would be a little um, claustrophobic to me, but I totally get, like, it's a big room and the kids aren't in here, so that's a good thing. Um, you can also look at drop leaf tables. If you are trying to do craft room or office in somewhere else in another space, one of those tables that's designed for a small apartment where it, it, its footprint is folded down with the leaves folded down. And then when you want to use it, you fold it up and swing an arm and that holds the table up and you can do both sides and swing an arm. Um, that's something you can do in an office. You can do it in a craft room. You can do it in a dining room where you want to be able to use it for part of the time. And then you can slow move the legs fold the side down and roll that table out of the way. That'd be a perfect thing to have in a guest room so that you could completely subtract the table out of the way. But otherwise, when there's no guests, you have a nice big table. Mezzanine space, mean, meaning carve out extra function in a space with a high ceiling. You want to tell me about that? That's the yeah. one that Ed added there. Yeah, a, a, a friend of mine in Europe is in this teeny tiny little house it's an you know extra house out in back of a bigger house and it's minuscule i mean maybe i don't know 300 square feet something like that yeah and he actually built in the bed it's sort of a bunk bed type thing except it's only one bed and the bed is up at it yes 
even though it's a tiny footprint, it's very high ceilings, maybe mm. 11 or 12 foot ceilings. And so we built in, it's a loft. Yeah, Eclair said the loft bed. It's so it, oh, there you go. You yeah. climb up a little ladder to get to the bed up there. And then below there is the TV and a desk and yeah, his, his uh, living space. That's a great idea, actually. That's a really great idea. And this is where going up the walls, things hanging over the doors, behind the doors, these all impact your ability to store and have extra functions in a room. And that's just a really, um, that's a bed example <laughs> of going up over your head yeah. and sleeping. Yeah, that works. Uh, another thing I ran across while looking at, looking into this topic was um a corner cabinet desk which i had never seen before so sort of like the corner cabinets you see for linens or and i don't know if somebody just took a thing that had been built for linens or uh housewares and pulled some stuff out to pulled out bottom shelves to create a desk space oh so you know mm -hmm. So it tucks into a corner and the doors close when it's not in use and provides, mm. you know, desk and some storage above. Right. That'd be clever. That would work. Um, I've also seen uh, if you have a lot of money to spend on uh, crafting your craft room, they do make furniture that swings open in the front and then folds all the way out. And then the desk folds down and you, so you get a work surface and you have all this interior storage that can then collapse and fold up. And um, the only thing about it that doesn't work is that hardly any crafter ever in the universe would put it away. <laughs> they would right. never close the doors ever, but it does create a lot of straight up along the wall storage that allows you to put away a lot of stuff. So um it's useful from that standpoint. I got to install one one time. It was a lot of fun. They had bought it and didn't know how to set it up. And so I got to go in and fill it up with a bunch of stuff. It was a good time. Nice. I shoved a lot in there. <laughs> okay. So who has questions about their multi-use space? What kind of comments you got out there for us? Eclair said corner cabinets are super, but boy, are they hard to find. Mm. I wanted to share a comment from Facebook and it's slightly tangential to the topic but i'd still like your your answer on it especially because it's from miriam coming to us from south korea oh hi miriam which Welcome. may be which may be a new farthest place away because that's pretty darn far away right um miriam says i struggle to keep materials in their designated rooms i always want to be in my main room so end up bringing everything in there and a lot of people struggle with that because they don't want to be alone in the room of the house where nobody else is hanging out that is a, that is not unusual frankly and so then it becomes i have this great craft room but i am not entertained by being back here so one thing i would ask is could you add in music a television um some kind of noise or entertainment that would allow you to stay in there or is it just that you want to be with the other people in the house? You want to relax the other people in the house. And so if that's true, then you do have to make it something portable. So this is where the idea of a rolling cart comes into play. You roll it out, hang out with the other family members, do your thing. And then you have to pack it up and roll it back away to keep it out of the space and not be crowding people, anybody else that's in there when you're not actually working on something. But what you're describing is very, very typical. And um, my friend Lorinda just moved into a house where they sit in, in recliners and watch the television and the dining tables at the same space, right? In same open area. And she has set up her bead room behind on the dining table and behind her on the di at the dining table and so now she can be sitting at the b table and talking to her husband and working on beating things and listening to audio of the television if she wants and so she's not isolated in a corner of the house somewhere um, while he's sitting somewhere else doing something else and so they can be together 
and she can still be working on her BE stuff. And, th and that's a new improvement for her because it wasn't true before. So what you're doing is typical. <laughs> so you might want to see if there's a way to make the main room where everybody hangs out, have a corner that is your craft area, your work project area, whatever it is you're working on, uh, create a zone in that room that's for you so that the full, you don't have the full volume of stuff there, but you do have a place where you can work and support yourself a little bit, have some of your supplies, some of your tools there and make them be portable. So that if you need them to disappear because guests are coming to hang out or you have friends coming over, the kids have friends over or whatever, you can move that stuff out of the way and that not everything is there just what I think of as a working set of things. And then all of the excess is stored somewhere else in, in the room that you don't like to hang out in <laughs> instead. And you may have to pull things in, put them on the car, use them, take that stuff, go back into the back room. You may have to walk back and forth the stuff that stays with you in your little work area. But if you do this frequently, then it's really one of the uses of the main room that you sit in there and do projects. And so creating a space for you to do that, allocating a portion of the room to your purpose uh, makes perfect sense. And so plan for that. Miriam added, it's just me and the cats, but some kind of noise or entertainment would make a big difference. And she said, incidentally, the vet says the cats feel the same. They want their toys and supplies where socializing is happening. There you go. See, they wanna, they wanna play with an audience. <laughs> <laughs> it's true well, they of dogs. want you to participate it's true of dogs too because if we're hanging out in the living room um hardy will actually go to if this if his chew his rawhide chew has made it to the bedroom he'll go in there and bring it out and sit with you, you know, yeah you want to hang out company, where the people right? are yeah. yeah 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 it's totally true well so then if if it's just you and the cats then you can just make any of the rooms work. And so then the room that you have tricked out, you should make it more um, entertaining and comfortable for you. If the only person that you have to make happy is you, then go for it and make it work for you and get the sound in there or the TV in there or the stereo in there, or whatever you need, the radio to make it a more pleasant stay for you. And you know, the kitties will just follow you wherever you go. So They'll just move with you when they, when you go back to that room. Well, and you know, one of our accommodations to living in small spaces is we bought a little uh, speaker, a little Bluetooth speaker. Yeah. That's about that big. And, um, oh, I'm gesturing, but people on the podcast can't, can't hear me can't gesturing. It. It's, you know, it's maybe, <laughs> I don't know, eight inches long and about four inches in each of the other two dimensions. And, and I can stream music from my phone in the living room so that we don't have to have, we don't have a stereo set up in the living room because I don't know where we would put it. Yeah, and, like there's no room for it, right? Um, Agatha mentions sometimes that room doesn't have windows with nice views. Subconsciously, we don't want to spend much time in them. Mm -hmm. And on a kind of related note, uh, Charity said, I have found I will declutter better if I have work sta station in the sunshine for the winter time. Things go, go in and go out much faster in that space. Because, you know, you're fighting against seasonal affective disorder. And it's, um, it's totally true that sunshine makes you feel more energetic and actionable. And, and it's part of the rhythm of life, right? That during the daytime, you're in motion and at nighttime, you're more relaxed. And so um, if you, if that's what you need, then set it up around that, make that work area be in affected in vicinity of the window, I guess is yeah. what I'm trying to say. And the other spaces that are more interior, you can help with the fancy or true blue light you know the light that has the full spectrum bulbs in it you can add some of those lamps in um there may be reasons why you need to use the interior room for something else but you can improve how it feels to you if you change the light that's available there invest in a good lamp like there's nothing more irritating to me when i'm walking around people's houses and i can't it's too dark it's like i can i turn a light on i say this a lot can i turn a light on oh yeah 
<laughs> and part of why you can't get anything done is because you can't see because there's no light in here. So if that's an impediment for you, it's worth spending the money to get a lamp in there that uh, or two or five or whatever you need, get a light fixture installed that makes a difference for you and how you feel and working in there. So you don't have to surrender a room, an interior room. Janet, uh, Janet says, packing up and rolling away a work desk is not too imaginable for me. So what is, you, what is your answer to that? I guess that means that that desk has to be one of the, that's part of the hard landscape of the, right. the space. So I would then aim for uh, A, finding a table that will function as a desk. Uh, don't make a distinction about how much footprint it's going to take up. You don't want the desk to be super huge in a room that's got to play more than one function. Uh, so a, a shallower desk, like the desk that I'm sitting on right now is basically two feet, two feet deep. So it's a long, narrow rectangular box. I mean, it, in the fact that it has little drawers on the bottom is what makes it a desk. But if it didn't have the drawers, it'd be an occasional table. <laughs> it'd be, it'd be one that you, it's sort of the shape of one that you would put behind a sofa. So you can work on a long, thin desk like that and then have um, some, a two drawer file cabinet, rolling carts, uh, other thing, book sh short bookshelves near you that allow you to uh, create some of the storage function you need around a desk and have it be permanent, but not have it be huge. Um, back in the day, a desk was this huge, long, wide, heavy, massive piece of furniture. And nowadays that's, and the little, even so the little drawers that you pulled out to put stuff in were really small. So they they were bulky and they didn't really help maximize your ability to store things and they took up a lot of room. Well, but you could hide under them in a game of hide and seek. They were very effective for that, which modern, right? desks, <laughs> modern desks do not usually work very well for hide and seek. When you were small enough to play hide and seek and yes. under a desk and my, now you would not fit. My dad had a desk in our study in, that I could hide under to this day, I would say. But <laughs> that desk had to go. That desk was probably a casualty of one of several moves. Right. You know? Yeah. Those, you know, executive function desks were basically the biggest thing that you could stub your toe on in the house i mean it was they used to be super massive and you can still get them but man you need a room for something that big you do not need that kind of a desk was not designed to share space with other functions in a room particularly not in the house so if you if you need to have a desk and you don't want it to roll then you know imagine a smaller footprint and some rollable pieces that accompany the desk that allow you to have that function and share it with something else in the room. Okay, we need to move on because we are running out of time. Um, okay. I did want to share because a couple of people have asked about, you know, what do you do if you come into the meeting late or you want to listen to it again? And so I want to announce for anybody who does not realize it that uh, we have a YouTube channel where we put all of these meetings, we, re we record them in Zoom and edit them lightly and then post them on our YouTube channel, which you can find by going to cfhou.com slash YouTube. There are about 200 videos there now. While you're there, subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon next to the subscribe button if you want to get notified when we post new content. Uh, let's talk for a moment about plans for next week. Okay. Sometimes the work of organizing is too overwhelming for one person or even one family to tackle, so we ask for help. But helpers who aren't sensitive to our goals, priorities, and emotional needs can create more problems than they solve. So in our next episode, we're going to offer guidance on asking for help with your decluttering projects or offering your assistance to others who need it. Join us on March 1st for many hands how to ask for decluttering assistance or offer yours let's talk tittle okay the tittle this week is you get your thing in action 
This is this title is a callback to the Schoolhouse Rock song about verbs, by the way, in case somebody <laughs> wondered. You get your thing in action. So this week's assignment is to improve the usefulness of a multifunction space in your home. Identify a space in your home that's struggling to serve multiple purposes. Make a list of the uses to which you'd like to dedicate the space and the household members who are going to use those spaces. Plan how you use the space so it won't default to serving as a catch-all. If you don't have a multifunction space and you have trouble finding space for everything you like to do, then intent, you can spend time this week reflecting on any spaces in your home that aren't used frequently and start a list of ways that you might reclaim part or all of this space to serve another function. Between those two, either you already have a, a multifunction space that you're trying to organize or you hadn't thought about it until now, uh, that's your tittle for this week. Think about multifunction spaces and do a little planning and then come back and tell us how it went. Excellent. Tammy shared, I had a bad experience with asking for declutter help. I was criticized and felt hurt. And that's precisely exactly why we're going to talk right about that. In next there. Week. That's one of the many things we're going to talk about next week. Yeah. Right. <laughs> if you're watching this on YouTube, we would love for you to join us live to get notifications about upcoming events. We invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by going to cfhou.com slash Facebook or subscribe to our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We love to hear from you. So please keep your questions, comments, and topic suggestions coming in YouTube, Facebook, or anywhere that you find us. And you can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. Thanks, everybody, for joining this week. We love to have you, and we're so excited that somebody came from South Korea. That's We, we, we should have a little uh, map somewhere pinned with all the people yes. that join us from all over. It's lovely that everybody comes. Thank you so much, and we will see you next week. And, go, and now go back to bed. <laughs> go back to bed. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.